Hello and welcome to River City Online.
Hello and welcome to River City Online. We're excited to have you join us today. As we get started, please take a moment and say hi. Hi. In the chat and let us know that you're here. We anticipate that we will experience God's presence today as we worship together. Feel free to connect to your host or ask for prayer at any time during the service. And you have a great day.
Hey everybody, Pastor Kevin, thanks for joining me. We are in a series called God's Big Story, a long-term series, and we're in part 14, looking at the whole arc of scripture and all the kind of major milestones across the biblical arc. So excited to be in Joshua chapter three today called Crossing Over the Children of Israel. Last message we did, we were in chapter one, we were looking at Joshua's, Joshua had gotten this command uh, from the Lord. Okay, it's time, take them in after 40 years in the wilderness. And you just gotta remember that Joshua, I mean, he had been wandering in the wilderness for 40 years uh, with the people of Israel. He had come out of Egypt. He was about 40 years old when he came out of Egypt. And then he's now 80 years old and God gives him the green light to take the children of Israel into the promised land. Moses has passed away. As a matter of fact, look at Joshua 1, 2 to 3. It says, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all these people, all this people to the land which I'm giving to them, the children of Israel, every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses. So the fulfillment of the promise is happening. And if fast forward down to verse 10 of chapter 1. Then Joshua commands the officers of the people saying, pass through the camp and command the people saying, prepare provisions for yourselves for within three days you will cross over this Jordan to go in to possess the land which the Lord your God is giving you to possess. So 40 years of waiting, 40 years of the, you know, the old generation has passed away, the new generation is, is with him. And Joshua and Caleb, some of the only ones, you know, left, they're going in, they're going in. And this is, I just can't imagine this moment. I just can't imagine like, it's really here. It's really happening. And, and so uh, if, if we look at, that's chapter one, if we look at chapter two, uh, Joshua, he gets this, okay, it's time, it's time. We've just got a few days, three days. And um, he sends in some spies to go check out Jericho, kind of the first big city they had to conquer and the one they would come up against once they crossed over uh, into the promised land. And so he sends some spies in to check it out. Well, the story of Rahab, the, the woman of the night, uh, the harlot, it says in scripture in the New King James, uh, they go to her house, they're lodging there, they're checking out this kind of, you know, they're being covert as they can, but word gets out to the leaders in the city. Hey, these, these, some of these children of Israel are here. They're spying out our, <laughs> spying out the city. Let's go get them. They're at Rahab's place. They go to Rahab's place. Uh, she hides them. She covers, she just she puts them up on the roof, tells them to hide. She goes, I don't know where they went. They've already left. And uh, she, boy, she stands in. She really does an amazing, courageous act. And it's, it's in this chapter too, and you should read it this week. I'm not going to read, I'm going to read a couple verses to you, but matter of fact, let's look at it in verse eight to nine of chapter two. It says, now before they lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to them, men, I know that the Lord has given you the land, that the terror of you has fallen on us and that all the inhabitants of the land are faint hearted because of you. So Rahab knew Rahab had, as you read the chapter, Rahab had a clear sense that the children of Israel, God was on their side and the people of Jericho, she says to the spies, Hey, we are all afraid. We're faint hearted. Uh, God, we know God is giving you the land. And so that was an amazing clue to the spies, amazing clarity for them to go, Oh, wow. The city, the people of Jericho, sure, this looks fortified. This looks like it'd be really powerful and strong, but the people, God's already been way ahead of us and he's working on the people. As a matter of fact, that's the thing. God's making a way forward. That, that is my first point. God is making a way forward. When you and I are walking into God's promises, let's just bring this to us today. When we're, for the people of Israel, children of Israel, that was what was happening. He was, he was taking them into the promise land. Well, God's already ahead of you and I, and he was ahead of them making a way forward. 
he had already been working on the people of Jericho. He'd been working on the other inhabitants of the land, right? Because it was going to be to go in to possess the land. To go into the land is one thing, but to own it, to possess it, is going to take some fights and some battles and some struggle and some obstacles. And we're going to look at the first of that today. Um, and so, but I just, I'm so encouraged as I think about this story because I think, the clue here with Rahab in chapter two and that part of the story is God had already been working ahead. He'd already been working on the hearts and he, in his kindness, he gives them a clue, gives the spies the clue from Rahab to give to them to then bring back to Joshua. But look at verse 18. It says this about the favor, I believe. It says, uh, unless when we come into the land, you bind this line of scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down. And unless you bring your father, your mother, your brothers, and all your father's household to your own home. What's happened here is that Rahab has said, listen, I've, you know, stepped out and, and, you know, hid you guys here so you wouldn't get destroyed by the leaders of Jericho. Uh, will you, will you remember me? Remember me, remember my family, remember my household when you come in to conquer the land. And, and, and then she lets them down with this scarlet, this red cord out of her window. And that's how they escape from the leaders. Well, he, they say, listen, keep that scarlet cord in the window and anybody who you, from your household, bring them to your house. We can only promise that we won't destroy this house, but we can't promise anything else. As a matter of fact, 23 and 24 of chapter two says, so the two men returned, descended from the mountain, crossed over, and they came to Joshua, son of Nun, told him all that had befallen them. So they give the report to Joshua and they say to Joshua, truly the Lord has delivered all the land into our hands for indeed all the inhabitants of the country are faint hearted because of us. So he he, the spies bring this good news back to Joshua. Joshua had a clear command to go in, but I'm sure in the natural, you gotta go, uh, there's a really big city called Jericho, huge walls, massive, fortified city. How are we gonna take this? And God clearly gives them a clue. Listen, not, not just a clue, like a clear message. Oh wait, they're already, God's been way ahead of us. He's been making a way this whole time. We should have known, but I just thought it was kind of God to see that in the scripture. It's so kind of God that that message gets back to Joshua. It's like, okay, all right, yep, we're on the right track. We're doing the right thing. This is right, this is right. I think that assurance, uh, God reinforces the assurance, right? Especially when the faith step is massive, is huge. The, and so, so encouraging to me. And you can look for those in your own life too. I'd encourage you, look for the clues. Now, sometimes there's not as many as I'd like. I'm sure you think the same when God asks you to step out in faith and do something or to, to take a next move, make a next decisive step. But I tell you what, ask God, God, help me to see with eyes of faith, help me to see the things that are happening. And, um, and clearly Joshua, I believe had a nudge from the Lord. Hey, send some guys in. And, and as he sends the spies in, this is what comes back. And look at that. The favor was not only on the two spies and then that message back to Joshua, but the favor was also on Rahab and her household. And isn't it interesting that you see uh, how that points to Jesus, that, that Rahab's uh, lineage is there as well as in, in Jesus's lineage. And, and also uh, that, that the scarlet thread represents like the blood of Christ and how the salvation of her household came through that scarlet line, that scarlet thread. Uh, ah, this is cool how the symbolism all works. So, so that's the first point. God's making a way. God is making a way forward. He's making a way forward. Secondly, um, is this obstacle or opportunity? Obstacle or opportunity? It's interesting how we look at things. Are we up against an obstacle or is this an opportunity or is it both? When it comes to walking in God's promises, uh, there are opportunities, but they also appear to be obstacles and there will be obstacles. It's just how it is because remember, we're in a spiritual battle. <laughs> we are in a spiritual battle, you guys. This, this is, it, it would be nice if everything was, we think that everything was just smooth and easy, but just because some of the resistance or there's something difficult doesn't mean it's not God. I think God brings obstacles to us to test our faith. He also brings obstacles to us many times to strengthen us, to help us mature and grow. And in this situation, of course, they're facing an incredible obstacle called, uh, they know they're supposed to go in, but there's this Jordan River, <laughs> this huge river, and it's springtime and the, and the river's overflowing. And so look at verses one and two, Joshua rose early in the morning, set out, we're now in chapter three, set out from Acacia Grove and came to the Jordan, he and all the children of Israel and lodged there before they crossed over. So it was after three days that the officers went through the camp. So remember, just, just 
just to refresh your memory here, there's over, there's over a million people. The children of Israel are more than a million at this point. We don't exactly know the exact number, obviously, but that's a lot of people. Like, I, we live in a, I live in a community of, you know, 50,000 people. I can't fathom living in a community of a million plus people that's mobile all the time. So they're camped at the, camped at the, the banks of the Jordan River. It's springtime. And so the, the rivers are overflowing. They're in flood stage, right? So to, how do you take a million people uh, and all their stuff, all their supplies. Now they were good at mobile. They'd been living mobile for 40 years. So they knew how to move and, and groove that way. They were used to that. But to get through a riverbed, you know, to cross the river, because some people, some, some people would refute, well, is it that big a deal that they crossed over this river? Well, think about it. All your supplies, all your stuff, muddy, well, you know, even, you know, it, it just, it's a huge obstacle. It's a huge logistical challenge. And, but, God's like, I've got this. I've shown you some favor. I've told you to do it. I've given you a clue uh, from Rahab in Jericho through the spies that came. Listen, this is an opportunity. This is just an obstacle. It seems big, but I've got you. Now, now how, how's God going to do this? Well, uh, Joshua had questions and, and he, he had some concerns, I'm sure. But more than that, he recognized that this obstacle wasn't a much a natural obstacle as it was a spiritual obstacle. Yeah, he, I think he really saw that it was a spiritual obstacle. And so he's like, okay, God, I trust you. I trust you. And he seeks God and he does what it, he challenges him to do back in, in chapter, chap, excuse me, chapter one, where he's like, meditate on my law on the scripture day and night. Keep it in you, ruminate on it, think about it, chew on it, spend time with me, talk to me, be in my presence. Remember, remember it's key to be in my presence, to be in my word. Focus on me, Joshua, focus on me. And so that's what he does. And it's incredible. And so I want to say to you, just thinking about obstacles and thinking about maybe places that you might feel stuck even today, what things are paralyzing you right now? What decision is paralyzing you? What obstacle are you facing? Uh, are you looking at it just as an obstacle? Or are you looking, are you bringing it to God and saying, God, this thing, I admit this feels like an obstacle. It seems like an obstacle, but God, it's an opportunity for you, God. And I bring it to you in prayer. And, and I was thinking a, a story that I've told many times, but I just, it's such a clear one in, in my mind from when Shelly and I were in our first year of marriage and we had a decision to make. And it's the first year of marriage. That was 31 years ago. And we were, we were going to go on staff with Campus Crusade. We had done all the paperwork. We'd done all the interviews. We were, but we couldn't get a piece about going on staff. We were going to leave the valley, the Lewis Clark Valley, of which we'd grown up. Because we thought to do anything big for God, to do anything good for God, you got to get out of this place. Certainly, God, you won't have a stay in Lewiston and Clarkston Valley. I mean, what are you thinking? And, um, and we, just, we just wanted to do what God wanted, but we assumed that that meant leave. And we were just taking natural steps, uh, you know, that prayed about it, but we were taking steps that we thought God was in. And I believe he was in those. But we come down to the decision point and we couldn't get a piece about it. And so, man, we were at each other. We were talking and arguing and trying to figure it out. And I was paralyzed and felt so stuck with this obstacle of this decision. And anyway, it, 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 it was it was it was paralyzing. I mean, ultimately, it, for me at the time, it, as twenty as a twenty three year old, it was just it just seems like such a huge decision because I'm like, I can I don't want to make a bad decision for Shelley or for myself. God, I want what you want, but I just remember the wrestle and the struggle and the wrestle and the struggle. It's like God, if I go down that path, what will happen? What if I miss you? And uh, 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 now you know now in retrospect, it doesn't seem like such a big deal, but I remember at the time it felt like a huge deal. I'll tell you the rest of the story in a minute. So, so the first one was God's making a way forward. The second point was, is this an obstacle or an opportunity? I think it can be both, right? You might go, is this just a spiritual opportunity? Or I mean, a spiritual obstacle that the enemy's thrown is just, just spiritual resistance? Or God, what are you up to in this thing? So you gotta acknowledge it and recognize it and see it. And then do this, this third point, which is this, let God's presence lead. Let God's presence lead. Ah, I, I think if you, I don't want to encourage you to read one through three, but at least read chapter three this week. And you'll just see here very clearly that Joshua wasn't making a move without letting God's presence lead him personally, but also 
as the people are getting ready to go through, you're going to see here what happens. Let's look at it. Verse 2. And we'll go down to five. So, so it was, we're talking about letting God's presence lead. So it was after three days that the officers went through the camp. They, remember, millions of people. They commanded the people saying, when you, look at this. When you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God and the priests and the Levites bearing it, carrying it, then you shall set out from your place and go after it. Yet there shall be a space between you and it'll be about 2,000 cubits by measure. Do not come near it that you may know the way by which you must go for you have not passed this way before. And Joshua said to the people, sanctify yourselves or set yourselves apart for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. I love verse five. The Lord will do wonders among you. Like, hey, remember this, set yourselves apart. Pray, think about this, chew on this. What God's about to do comes after 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, after 430 years in slavery, your, your ancestors, God is bringing you into the promise. You are the generation, the Joshua generation to go in. I think he's saying, this is a big, big, big deal. Chew on it, think about it. But look what in, in verses three and four, when he's like, remember the, when you see, he's saying, when, when the, the commanders are saying to the people, pay attention to where the Ark of the Covenant is. Pay attention to where the priests and the Levites, where they're at. That's what you need to follow. And he gives some really specific instructions here about being 2,000 cubits uh, away by measure. What's 2,000 cubits? Well, 2,000 cubits is like a thousand yards, like 10 football fields distance. So he's giving some spiritual advice, some spiritual direction, and some, I believe, some natural direction. He's saying, listen, stay at least 10 football fields, 2,000 cubits away from the ark. Why is that? Well, they need to be far enough away that they could see it. They could see where they were going, right? Because there's so many people. It's a million people. So it's like, keep your distance. Also, keep re respect the ark. This is the presence of God, right? Carried in the ark here, representing that. And listen, it's holy. It's sacred. It's going to lead us, though. It's going to lead us. See, it's interesting because the ark, at that point, the ark of the covenant was in the midst of the people. It was never leading. But here, it's leading. It's not, in Moses' day, Moses was out front. He gets the staff out at the Red Sea and he parts the water. Here, what's going first? It's not Joshua. It's the Ark of the Covenant. It's God's presence, representing God's presence. Because Joshua knew that prayer and presence is what was needed here. He sends the priests out. He sends the Ark of the Covenant out. He's not, he doesn't send the engineers out to build a bridge over, over the Jordan. He's like, this is a spiritual obstacle we're up against here. And I'm going to send God's presence, asking God's presence to lead first. We're going to follow the spin, do the spiritual work needed, the spiritual battle. And that's what he's saying to the people. And this was God's directive, of course. So that's what God's asking them to do. Stay in clear view of the ark and let it lead. Let God's presence lead. Verse six, then Joshua spoke to the priest saying, take up the Ark of the Covenant and cross over before the people. So they took up the Ark of the Covenant and went before the people. And so Joshua is taking these steps of faith to go to send the priests. It's go time. I, I was just thinking about what was Joshua thinking? Because I mean, up to this point, he, you know, I mean, it's 40 years of waiting. It's, it's, it's like, this is the moment, the faith moment. Like I got to give the click the green light go God's given me the green light but I'm sure there was a wrestle but he he goes after it he says go you know priests go and they take the ark of the covenant up for the people and boom Joshua's saying let's let God's presence lead us into the new territory greater victories this next season God we're going to possess for what you've promised you know, generations before we believe in you and we're walking, tangibly walking into it. Verse seven and eight. And the Lord says to Joshua, this day I will begin to exalt you in the sight of Israel, that they may know that I, that as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. You shall command the priests who bear the Ark of the Covenant saying, when you have come to the edge of the water of the Jordan, you shall stand in the Jordan. And I think it's just interesting to note here um, <laughs> that uh, look at look what it says there. Leave that up on the screen if you would. When you come to the edge of the water of the Jordan, you shall stand in the Jordan. If they 
would have remembered, and of course I'm sure they did because they'd heard the story of when they came out of Egypt and crossed the Red Sea, right? Nobody got their feet wet, right? Moses parted the water and then it, and it dried up and they walked across, right? But in this situation, isn't it interesting that they have to put their feet in the water and stand in the water with the water going across their feet and, um, and so I, I think one thing I think about when I see that is I think, listen, God doesn't always do it the same way every time. He doesn't always do it the same way every time. I think our tendency is to want to make a formula out of how God moves and works, right? We have clear things in scripture that are clear, but there's things that, that, that aren't the same every time. God moves differently. Even how Jesus did miracles in the gospels, different, many times different approaches, different ways. He didn't, he wasn't trying to mimic it a certain way. And I think that's because we have a tendency as humans to want to formulize things. And when we formulize things, we forget to rely on God. <laughs> we forget to let his presence lead us. We forget to let, we can have the truth or the principle, but remember this is a relationship with the living God who leads us. And that's what Joshua is doing with the people. He's saying, let my presence lead. And um, so it's so key. Look at verse nine. Let's go to there. So Joshua says to the children of Israel, come here and hear the words of the Lord your God. Joshua says, by this you shall know that the living God is among you, that he will without fail drive out uh, from before you the Canaanites. There's going to be a lot of ites here, okay? Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Jebusites. I love saying all those names. Behold, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of all the earth is crossing over before you into the Jordan. We're going to see that, that like 14 times in 17 verses it mentions the Ark, the Ark, the Ark, the Ark, the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Lord. Why is that? Let God's presence lead. If you get nothing else from this message today, get that. Let God's presence lead. Yeah, man. I need to hear it, you need to hear it, we need to hear it over and over again. Because why? Because we get independent and we get formulaic and we think we'll just do it our way. We gotta fight pride, we gotta fight uh, our, just doing things the way we've always done them. Let God's presence lead. Remember, this is a relationship with a living God. All right, let's go down, back to the verse 12. Now, therefore, take for yourselves 12 men from the tribes of Israel, one man from every tribe, and it shall come to pass as soon as the soles of your feet, of the feet of the priests who bear the ark of the Lord and the Lord of all the earth shall rest in the waters of the Jordan. There it is. That the waters of the Jordan shall be cut off and the waters that come down from upstream, they shall stand as a heap. So it was when the people set out before the camp to cross over the Jordan, when the priests bearing the ark of the covenant before the people. So. We just see the, the, you know, I just want you to know it, read it, and see it. But listen, isn't that amazing? Think about this. He's just saying, this is what's going to happen. Let God's presence lead. Let the ark, and this ark of the covenant, it, it's symbolizing the constant and tangible presence of God in the midst of his people. And as I, as I mentioned before, God's, the ark was in the midst of the people, but now we see the ark going before the people. And, and I, I think because, you know, the, this generation needed to know clearly God's presence is the one who leads us. He is leading us into the promised land. It's not Joshua, it's God, his presence. And so that was very intentional on God's part. Joshua, have this happen. Let Do it this way so that my people see, the millions of people that I love, my promised people, my, my, my special promised people of Israel, that my children of Israel, that they're gonna walk into the promise and I want them, but I don't want them to think it's them that's, that, that, you know, soloing this thing. No, 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 no. Ah, it's me. It's my presence. And so, so key, so important. And, um, and Joshua was leading the people to cross the Jordan. That meaning of that act of faith was, the, the, it, was a, it was a full submission to God's leading and covenant relationship with them. And, and God is, is just like, listen, I love my people, but I've got to go first. Let my presence lead. And, and we see the, the covenant and the old covenant, and we tie the Ark of the Covenant to the old covenant, uh, where we, you know, the, the laws and, and all that that we're going to see happen here. Uh, we've, we've seen happen already in the passage of Scripture in Exodus that, that God's saying, listen, 
all this is pointing to Jesus who will create a new covenant, right? Uh, Jesus, Jesus, everything in scripture is pointing to Jesus and that new covenant is that promise that God will forgive sin, that he'll restore fellowship with those whose hearts are turned toward him, right? And Jesus Christ is the mediator of that new covenant and his death on the cross is the basis of that promise and his death, his burial and his resurrection. And so we see that all this is pointing to Jesus just as that story of Rahab points to Jesus and we see all these the arc of scripture these things point to Jesus Joshua is a type of Jesus and Joseph is a type of Jesus and uh, yeah it's so cool how God works that way and so let me go back to Shelly and I's story because the rest of the story was we were at this impasse and stuck at this obstacle and um, and we go to a conference uh, one weekend that, that, and we were invited and it was at River City and uh, we weren't regular attenders at River City at the time but we knew the pastors and we got invited to this conference and on the last night of the conference there was an altar call time a time where they had uh, the people who were teaching and sharing the word there they were praying over people and so Shelly and I go down for prayer and it was such a powerful time and some you know encouragement and comfort but there were some prophetic words that came and as they were prophesying over us and sharing what God had showed them it was like they were reading parts of our conversation. It's like they read our mail, if you would. It's like, it's like things that only Shelly and I knew. We hadn't told anybody else. God was revealing to them to share with us. And it was so supernatural. It, it was like, it, it sh literally, they were quoting parts of our conversations that we had had. And, and it was, there was clarity on, you think you're supposed to leave this place. You've been in battle with each other over whether you should do it. God is saying God has planted, wants you to be in this community. He's got a work for you to do here. He wants you to be in this church. I mean, these people didn't know us. These were people from out of town. They didn't know us. And nobody else knew that we were wrestling or struggling with this. I mean, it was so clearly God. We had never experienced anything like that before. But here's the thing. You might go, I don't know if I believe in prophecy or things like that. That seems crazy supernatural. It is crazy supernatural. It's awesome. It's very scriptural. But Here's the thing, what it did was actually confirm what Shelly and I had already been sensing and feeling from the Lord, but we were so wrestling with this obstacle of taking this step of faith because we knew going on staff with Campus Crusade, that's a godly thing, that'd be an awesome thing. That's, that doesn't a bad, on the outside, doesn't seem like a bad decision, but we had a check, we had a concern. Why was that? Well, because God wanted us to be in the valley <laughs> and stay here and wanted us to be slightly involved in River City Church. We just didn't know it at the time. That was 31 years ago, right? So what's, the, what, what's my point? We need to let God's presence lead. So as you're in scripture, as you're praying, the Holy Spirit can speak to you from the scripture. That's first and foremost. And he'll put things in your heart and things like a prophetic word or a sermon you're listening to or a conversation you're having with somebody, God can use other people, he can use wise counsel, he can, clearly uses his scripture, but the Holy Spirit will highlight things to you and bring you a, a, a word, a rhema word, if you will, an in-season specific word that'll help be that confirmation or that presence leading, God leading you in specific questions and decisions that you have to make. And so I want to encourage you, God loves to do that. He had given Joshua a clear uh, word to go in. It's time. The time is now. They had a long-term promise to go into the promised land, but the timing of when to step in, God gave it to him. And he had confirmation of that. He had clarity on that. And then he's like, God, we're going to follow your presence in. And you guys, in our lives, in, in decisions we have to make, in steps of faith, listen, there is promises as his kids, as his children, his sons and daughters that we get to walk in and flow in. And we need to always remember to let his presence lead. And we let his presence lead by taking steps of faith. And, and so look at verse 15 and 16. Because let's, let's look at what happens before I get to the fourth point, which is take a step of faith. But let me look at 15 and 17 of chapter 3. It says, As those who bore the ark came to the Jordan, because we've got to see this part, and the feet of the priests who bore the ark dipped to the, into the edge of the water, for the Jordan overflows all its banks during the whole time of the harvest, that the waters which came down from upstream stood still and rose up in a heap very far uh, away at Adam, the city that is behind Zaretan. So the waters that went down into the Sea of Arabah, the salt sea failed, were cut off. The people crossed over opposite 
opposite of Jericho. Then the priests who bore the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firm. Look at this. On dry ground in the midst of the Jordan and all Israel crossed over on dry ground until all the people had crossed completely over the Jordan. They didn't cross over on muddy ground. They didn't have to slog their way through. As soon as the priest got their feet in there, boom, parted waters, heaped up, up river, and boom, they, the ground dried out supernaturally, and they went across millions of people on dry land. That is a crazy miracle. And think about how this is bookend. This miracle bookends the other miracle when they came out of Egypt and had to cross over the Red Sea. That's one bookend and now another huge, there's been some miracles in between, but this is a massive miracle and a similar miracle, right? The parting, right? The parting of the Red Sea and the parting of the Jordan. Isn't it interesting that those bookend, that God took you out of something and now he takes you in to the promises. Listen, what an incredible thing. And what did they do? Well, they took a huge faith step. And that's what I want to encourage that you and I are called to do. We're called to take faith steps. It may not feel like this bigger one, but listen, sometimes it's the small ones that paralyze us the most. And, um, and remember that faith step was a massive choice, a massive decision. And, and, um, and so this Joshua generation goes in and, and how do you do that? How do you take a step of faith? Uh, because... When God gives you clarity on a, a, a thing in the future he wants you to walk into, you gotta ask him about the timing, you gotta trust him with that, but he wants us to lean in. He wants us to prayerfully lean in and talk to him about the future and pray about the future and the next things that you see in scripture that he wants you and things that, words that you have that God's spoken over you and about you and about your future. You have to war for those words, right? Because you don't just passively sit back. You lean in, in prayer and say, God, I'm trusting your presence to lead me. And as you lean in, you're going to take those steps by faith. And Hebrews 11:6 6 says, without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he is, uh, he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Okay, so without faith, it's impossible to please God. So we know that we access Everything God has, the promises by faith, right? And so, and so um, faith is the currency of God. It's the currency of his kingdom. But there's a, there's a verse in, in or chapter 11, verse 1, just right before chapter, verse 6, rather. It says this, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That word substance, leave that on the screen. It's a hupostasis, hupostasis in, in the, the Greek. And, um, and it means under the authority of. In, in, in the biblical times, that would have been like, uh, imagine a package of legal documents. And the substance here is, it was under the authority of, the, the authority of legal documents. It has the backing of the authority of a legal document. So for instance, an example would be a title deed to a house. So if you, let's say you bought a house but you never walked through the house. You never physically touched the house, but you, but you had lived in another city. People are doing this all the time now, living in another community. They're moving to another community. They see the house online. They see pictures. They see, they see stuff, but they're not actually physically there. But you, you, could, you can um, get the legal paperwork done the title deed to the house, you know that legal people have backed this up, read through this, you got everything done and signed and all that, and you now have the title deed. That title deed is the proof of your ownership of that thing, of that house, right? If you have the title deed, you own the house, even if you've never walked through the house, even if you've never touched that house. This is, this is what this word is, this word substance. So faith is when you and I see something in the, in the eternal, right? In the, in the supernatural that hasn't actually been seen in reality yet. That kind of faith he's talking about here means a title deed kind of faith. I have, like I possess the title deed by faith of this thing that God's promised me. Listen, there's a whole bunch of things in scripture we can claim by faith that he has for us, right? Our salvation, right? You, you, you have the title deed. You, listen, it's by faith you and I believe that we're saved, right? Uh, and his grace is good enough and it covers our sin. And we're bought with that price that he took care of it for us. He took care of our sin for us. And there are things that he promises us that we can walk into, right? But what you're asking for is, God, give me the, that, 
that substance faith, faith that not just an idea, not just a dream, but what happens is that God, when he's birthing a faith vision in you, he grows it, right? And it gets to this point where it has a substance to it that even though you haven't maybe seen it in the natural yet, like you can't physically touch it yet, you know, by, by, you have the weightiness of a title deed behind it. And you go, no, I know this is gonna happen. Listen, for River City Church, like I know God's gonna allow us to plant at least 30 churches. I'm believing for more than that. But I know, I know in my knower, God's gonna have us do that. I'm not saying it's gonna be easy. I'm not saying it's, I don't exactly know all the timing, but I know God wants us to have it. I got it here because God birthed that in, not in just me, but others. And I believe God wants us to do that. It, yeah, it's his idea. He birthed it up there in the, in the supernatural. And he says, no, I want, now I, Kevin, I want you to partner with, with many others to do and expand my kingdom. And this is one of the things I want to happen through River City Church. And I'm gonna be, get to be a part of that along with many others. Listen, God wants to give you that kind of faith. And so, listen, I, I don't know which thing hits you this morning or, or whatever time you're watching this or listening to this, but I, but I wanna wrap this up. I, you know, what, what obstacles are you facing? What opportunities are you noticing God's making a way and the favors there? And, is there a step of faith God wants you to take today? So let's pray about this and just ask God to show you what your next step is. And, and hopefully this encourages you. All right, let's pray. Jesus, thank you for the opportunity to look at this story in Joshua. God, I'm asking that you stir faith. Stir faith, give people uh, next level, uh, that substance faith, that hypostasis faith. Lord, believing that title deed kind of faith uh, Lord, and when they uh, come up against an obstacle, God, they, they'd be able to step into it and through it, seeing it as an opportunity, God, and they would do that because they're letting your presence lead. They wouldn't try to do it in their own strength, but they would trust you and trust you with timing and ask for a green light. When a green light is ready, when you're ready, they'd know it and they'd step into it by faith. So God, I just ask that as you're just, you know who's tuning in, who's gonna be listening to this, Lord, I pray, God, you would help them take a step today. Take a step of faith in Jesus' name, amen, amen. If you've never said yes to Jesus too, take a step of faith today. Surrender your life to him, say yes to him. He offers a gift to you, it's so incredible. And I wanna encourage you, take a step of faith and invite him into your life and say yes to him. I love you. We'll see you next week. Thank you for joining our River City Family Worship Service today. Our prayer is for you to experience the mighty power and presence of God every single day through this week. If this was your first time with us, please text RCC New to 97000. And if you surrendered your life to Jesus for the first time, we are so excited and we want to know more. So please text RCC Life to 97000 as well. You can also stick around and chat with your online host. Let us know how your day's gone. Let us know how the service was. Have a great week.